All right, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is the Integrated Tech Network panel. Um, so this is, my, this is my first time moderating, so this might get interesting. <laughs> um, but actually, what's funny is, so my first job out of college, I was hired by Bill Murphy, who's here. Um, and I actually learned Sorry a lot to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually learned a lot of my public speaking because he used to make us go in front of the entire uh, tech team and company often uh, and talk about what we were building. So uh, thanks for that. Appreciate it. Awesome. Um, but so I'm the CDO of, uh, of ETS. Uh, I focus on APIs, um, deployment, um, data, uh, data science. So there's a few data science initiatives. I'm familiar with a lot of your accounting systems as I've been personally involved in a lot of the integrations. Um, so in terms of the actual um, the, the format here, we're going to have the uh, audience ask questions as needed. Um, we're not going to be too formal, like go down right, right down the line. If whoever of the panelists feels like they have an interesting thing to say, then say that thing. Um, <laughs> um, you're, you're a great speaker. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. I take no responsibility. <laughs> <for this whatsoever. laughs> All right, so just to start out, we're going to go do, uh, we will go down the line to do introductions. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Enton. I'm the CIO of Ornado Realty Trust. Um, we're a New York based uh, REIT with uh, significant holdings here in the New York area and in uh, Washington, D.C. for at least the moment. Um, and so our portfolio is virtually all Class A office uh, with uh, a fair amount of street retail in the New York. Cool. I'm Bill Murphy. Uh, I'm the CTO at Blackstone. I'm sure everybody knows who Blackstone is. Um, uh, I was also the founding CTO at Capital IQ, which is where I hired uh, Rick a long time ago. Uh, I'm Jonathan Lang. I'm the CIO of Colony North Star, uh, a New York and Los Angeles based REIT, and uh, currently working through digesting the merger of those two companies that just occurred in January. Can I steal your microphone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need another microphone, by the way. Feel a little bad. He's all over. Yeah, the, uh, John Hart, CIO of uh, Fentas and also Little Bridge Corporation. Um, been doing that for about five years now. And uh, Jim Whale from Boston Properties, uh, CIO there. We are in uh, Boston, New York, uh, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and L.A., and uh, obviously uh, a REIT, uh, primarily office. So. Cool. To, so to get us started, um, we're going to talk about a little bit uh, more about the core investments that you can make from a technological perspective um, to compete in a more digital ecosystem. So first question, um, what are some best practices uh, in consolidating and managing data when you're dealing with multiple systems or multiple APIs? Uh, for me, I think it's um, rationalizing the data model between the various products. You know, the real estate data model should be pretty standard. You know, buildings, floors, spaces, tenants, leases. Um, but not every product looks at it the same way. Um, and so I think the first part is rationalizing how the various systems are going to treat that. And then, then you got to deal with the pushing and pulling data back and forth. Yeah, I mean, I would say even brief more down to the studs, which is like the property itself. Make sure that that is in one place and one place only. And then, you know, and then you can kind of build up from there in logical units, almost like, you know, your, your data environment's like a bunch of Lego blocks. So you need to make sure that you, they all fit together. Um, the minute you have a, one that's a different size or, or shape, you're, you're not gonna be able to, um, to plug that in. And most firms, I think, spend uh, plenty of money on existing, or I'm sorry, like siloed systems. Everybody wants to have best of breed, so they, you know, they buy a leasing system, and then they, oh, I want to do asset management, let me buy a separate system for that, or let me do something else for accounting. Or, and they spend plenty of money on each, but they spend no money connecting them well. So I would say you want to spend at least as much um, figuring out how it all fits together versus just buying the individual systems. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with all of that, and I think there's, in addition to having to deal with data consistency and alignment and kind of getting that solved, getting to a point where you have a single source of the truth, even if it is being distributed through multiple systems, there has to be a master. And that's one of the challenges I see in a lot of the kind of legacy siloed systems that I inherited, is like, you'll have asset details in multiple places, and they won't be consistent. And so you get into this argument about which data is correct. And getting that so it's systematic and automated is, is, is critical. And then no one trusts either system, even though one of them might be correct, if that happens, right? So you know, if you don't get it, if you don't get it. So. 
I, I attended the meeting once where two parties argued about whose NOI was correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, you know, the, the, the challenge I think is, uh, you know, clearly with cloud, right? So, you know, if you look at the context of like what the investments we've done, last, you know, last four years, five years, everything's been a SaaS play, right? Extending off a, a build in the enterprise, and we have really great data standards that we have at Boston Properties, and then extending it out. So we've done a, you know, an energy play with Enernoc, we've done BTS, and we've done, a, we've done an HCM with Oracle, and all those, you know. So the challenges are also around the cloud, right? The cloud, as we kind of move, I, Robert, I'm gonna steal your, your, your thunder. I, I, he, we, we, had a, we were together last month, and uh, use the term evaporate because we've got these systems that are evaporating into the cloud. I love that term. I've been using it internally, so I stole it. At least you gave us some credit here. <laughs> it's the new term. <laughs> but either you know, either you're adding new capabilities like we did with the BTS, or you're taking existing uh, you know existing capabilities, moving them out, right? Um, so it's, it's there's a unique challenge, and there's a whole new data you know solution set to help manage that, you know. Um, so there, there's something to actually watch, there's cloud, um, you know, cloud kind of data, um, data, um, uh, you know, kind of governance um, models that are really interesting, you know, and something to keep an eye on. I, I would say that I, I don't see, as I mean, we were talking last month, and you know, we used the term, all of our computer rooms are slowly evaporating, and some are more aggressive than others, but they'll all end up there. I don't see the data transport issue as being as big an issue between cloud and premise as others, particularly since most of the cloud vendors do have open APIs. And so whether they're real-time web service APIs that you can get to from premise or otherwise, or whether they're bulk loaded, uh, ETLs, you know, I, yeah, I think that really rests on the vendor's openness, ultimately. Yeah, I would, I would say that you want to um, be highly skeptical of old-time vendors who say they're now in the cloud. I've, I don't know if I've ever seen a single vendor ever across, and this is not just real estate. Uh, we, uh, you know, we look across all the Blackstone um, investments, and uh, there's never been anybody who's actually transitioned well to a truly like, you know, an equivalent cloud architecture like a born digital company like BTS or or, uh, or Salesforce or somebody who's more kind of, you know, that's in their blood. Um, everybody does this like half-assed version of cloud, which is. I'm going to install and run a separate server for you in my own server thing, and then connect you to it and call it a cloud offering. So just make sure you dig into the to what cloud means because it's really different uh, based on the different types of companies. So I definitely hear where you guys are coming from with the, the various systems. Um, in a lot of cases, we accidentally become a data warehouse because we will be the first to do an integration with the various systems that a given owner or broker might be using. Um, in terms of strategies to connect all these various uh, evaporating systems, as you call them, um, what would you say that some, some like some strategies you've used that are successful uh, between like you know potentially implementing a data warehouse? Uh, there's a couple of companies out there now that are cloud-based integrators. Um, you know, you could go system to system and make <coughs> connections between each of them. Uh, what have you What have you used in the past, and what's been successful? And that's one of the key challenges we're doing now is we have a lot of operating partners and other people that we do business with that need to send us data and we need to exchange on a frequent basis. And you know, I agree with you completely on the you know, cloud providers like VTS know how to do this. And it's, it's a pretty easy exercise to get that done. We found there's a couple of good third party tools that we've looked at and have, have piloted that allow you to start to build the bridges uh, between people. Uh, Voyanta makes one, uh, actually Yardi themselves have a tool called Daz, which is one of their best kept secrets uh, for automating these sort of interfaces. And you know, these are the ways, like once you've identified the flow, you can put a standard approach in that has validation of the data feed. And for us that's key, uh, because we're trying to replace manually sourced data feeds with things that are automated and validate the data as it comes into our platform so that you know, people aren't doing the pick and shovel work to go through all the data. We can <coughs> spoon feed them a list of exceptions they need to manage. So we figure that if we capture it as it's coming onto our platform and verify accuracy, we're going to accelerate our reporting process. I think that there's another landmine there in terms of a data warehouse where I've seen a lot of times where people they say they want a data warehouse, they do all the brain damage the first time to bring it in and they check the data and then they massively underestimate the cost of keeping that up to date. Um, there's, there's a lot of hurdles. So the, most, the more you can hit the live systems in real time, um, the better. 
because it's, you know it's up to date because you're hitting the system that you're verifying on a, on a daily basis um, just through other workflows. So um, sometimes it's required to have separate data warehouses and data lakes and other things, but try to make them like extremely read-only and like budget for the cost of what it's going to take to maintain them. Yeah, the reality, uh, Bill, is just you know the the, speed, the pace of our business demands near, I mean, almost near real time. I mean, we we rebuild our data warehouse hourly during the day. I mean, I, and right. business would love it real time. And you know, that so costs a, a lot. That right? costs I mean, a lot of money. A lot of DBAs and yeah. a lot of stuff like that. So. People, a lot of folks who haven't been through this assume it's going to be easy, and it's uh, it's definitely much more costly than everybody uh, envisions right off the bat. But the key definitely is read only, um, and it, it, so I think of the data warehouse in two dimensions. One is just the consolidation. You can go hit all the real time systems, but do you put all the data, your your rationalized data model, in one place uh, so it's easier to mine from? And we've chosen that route. So we have one place which is read-only, and it's just the hierarchy, and all the systems feed it uh, on, on a constant basis. But, and that's, for us, it's nightly. Um, but there's, there's no writing to it at all. And that way, everybody is trying to pick from floors, <coughs> stacks, leases, uh, exclusives, and, and that sort of thing, gets it from the same place. But the second part of that would be the data warehouse or analytics, really, a, let's call it the BI side of the world. So I think you look at it as, where are you going to consolidate your data where everyone's going to pick from just to get the raw uh, truth versus where you're going to perform the analytics and stuff? I think one of the biggest use cases we've seen is when there's multiple operating partners, multiple partners, managing partners potentially. Um, there'll be 15, 20 different various systems, and that's the one place where you start with a data warehouse and then sort of go from there. Um, one of the sort of follow up questions is you know, when I first got into uh, CRE Tech, I had this vision, you know two, three weeks in, I'm like, it seems very difficult to connect these systems. It was one of the first things I was focused on. And <clears throat> I, I still have this vision. I'm not giving up on it. But I want to be able to go into like any of the major accounting systems, any of the major uh, you know, budgeting systems, and type, have someone type in their username and password, credential, their API credentials, uh, hit connect, and then the data flows into BTS. Right? That's where I want to be. So I've, obviously, there's a lot of work that would need to go into that from both, from many various different parties. Um, what would it take to get there? And sort of the follow-up question to that is, do you believe that a universal uh, data standard could exist? Other industries have the concept of, you know, if you're going to send this type of financial data, it should be in this exact format. Could you do that for leases? Could you do that for buildings? So let's start with the interrelationship between those companies because that's a core issue. Um, you know, we see this all the time where we may have, you know, we wind up in, in IT supporting multiple best of breed systems. And uh, what I observe happening frequently is that each of those entities are very focused on one thing and it's very internal. And what they don't understand necessarily intuitively is that this is an ecosystem. You know, the company doesn't use one tool, they use many, many, many different tools. The amount of time, thought, and investment that goes into the notion of interconnecting on a standards basis, it, at best it's an afterthought and you know this is something that I, I think everyone up here would agree, boy we would love it if there was a way to interchange data without going through conversion. They actually do it in more of an OLTP type of methodology. But that's really going to take entities that <coughs> sort of look at each other competitively um, to sort of turn things around and realize that, that they're actually participating in a single large entity that all has to function together for maximum value. You're being kind not to just say the vendors need to be open and they're not all open. Right. This is what it comes down to. First part of this is all the vendors have to have a really strong commitment, not with the words, but they have to, with their behavior, that they'll allow connections to their systems in one way or another to push and pull well, you know, any transaction. And I don't think we've done that. No, it's probably it's everybody in the room who's not a vendor that has the potential to make that happen. Like we, collectively could you know are the only way that that this gets done I mean they, they, we've, they've been trying to do this in the fund reporting from GPS to LPs for the last five six years and there was a number of different um, attempts at this and making a little bit of headway with some of the OPA reporting um, requirements but when it was driven by a software company um, alt exchange which is uh, and and because it was driven by a software company everybody was skeptical about it because they had other, they were basically just trying to get you to buy, 
buy more of their software. So I feel like it has to be like a Switzerland type of a lead effort. Um, uh, and the, you know, and the industry's so. been, you know, there's an Oscar, it's been 20 years and you know, like well intentioned, but or just the government. Yeah. yeah, the government or Switzerland or something. Like they've got to do something. I think Oscar is a good so if you start with the vendors with a real commitment, then you get you have this thing Oscar, which is at least a standard, a data standard, but I think as a dictionary it's so large and unwieldy, it's reflective of the complexity of the data model in real estate. But I, I my interpretation is that's one of the reasons why it hasn't been as widely it hasn't really caught much traction, but because I think it's a dictionary with nouns, not verbs. And what we need is verbs. We need get tenant, get floor, get stack, put stack. And so I think if you start, there might be an evolution here that says you've got this dictionary which is well thought out. Now if somebody comes along and says, let's start to publish simple verbs that everybody uses, and then starts to implement those, yeah. you've got a shot. Hey, Rick, wait, what's your take? Because I, you said, you know, I, I think I met you the first week you were on the job here. Yeah. I remember you were like, <laughs> yeah, so to that point, I actually, I got involved. Why is this product not built yet? I got, I got involved with Oscar. As soon as I found out Oscar existed, I started talking to them and I actually joined the board of Oscar. So now I'm attempting to influence the, the future state of that standard. Um, we've already made six major changes to the lease model. And one of the things I'm going to bring up at the next board meeting, which is next week, um, is the idea of maybe potentially simplifying the concept of the API calls. Right now, it's just a huge XML file for anything you're trying to, right? What if you just made simple calls and it just returned a, a snippet? Like which specifically which would be typical of today's web service model. Right. Right? right. They're, they're all sort conversations between two parties to accomplish a piece of a transaction without bringing in the whole. Yeah, so long story short, I'm working on it. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's great. Let us know when it's done. Yeah. <laughs> um, so switching topics, I wanted to um, sort of delve into the concept of uh, build versus buy. Um, so, you know, specifically, when is it best to build, when is it best to buy? Um, and then, you know, the, the sort of uh, transition topic will be, you know, you know, internal tech teams. How much should you invest? Is that a core competency? Is that a competitive advantage? Um, that type of sort of mentality. And everybody's sort of got a different uh, opinion there. So I have one pure software developer on my entire team. I have some consultants working, but I have one pure direct employee, and that's one too many in my, my judgment. Uh, don't, please don't tell him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is being televised. This <laughs> uh, I mean, truthfully, there are good solutions out there to manage a lot of the issues that we see, and I've found I've had a lot more traction finding good solutions and having technical staff in-house who create the glue between them, and create the bridges, and really understand the business so that they can be the bridge between business requirements and what the vendor is able to produce. Um, building things from the ground up these days, it's, I, I just don't think you, know, you ever get the level of expertise in-house that you can from somebody like VTS, who's got a, a deeper bench of talent, and it's, that's their core job, to build the yeah, best solutions. No, I mean, I, about eight or nine years ago, we, we used to, in the last decade, we had, uh, you know, a development team. We did in-house development, and uh, we got rid of almost all of it, and we, we, we focused on data. So I hired a data architect, because that was where competitive advantage for the company was. And now the demand, as you were saying, is really about, you know, the glue, you know, making the interaction. So there's, the, the demand is on the data integration side as we kind of work through, um, you know, these deployments. But I, I, I'm just out of software development. Um, you know, the data is another thing. Software development is. So we're probably on the other end of the spectrum, where we have a fairly large in-house team that does development. I think it's for us. My view would be similar and compatible. But <coughs> people who are, who are building highly specialized pieces of software like VTS, and the, the all the good point solutions that are in our space, you don't want to go anywhere near that because you've got 200 and some odd people spending their lives doing that. For me, it's two things. One is. Um, we, achieve, we achieve a much better level of integration because of our in-house capabilities, um, number one. And then the other, where, where we spend our time, is on building applications that we know are kind of one-offs. They're, so they're custom to Vornado because they wrap around the way Vornado operates, and then we're not going to find something in the market. But I do agree, the first thing you do is you look for somebody who's competent and professional and does it for a living, and then you figure out how to buy that and integrate it into your wheel of application. Yeah, for us, it's, it's really an economics question. Ultimately, you know, the, the bad news about building something is then you build something. And so now you have code and you have operating systems and all of this um, infrastructure that has to be managed. 
So unless there's, it, in, in some cases, it's what we call the mortar or the glue, if you will, that, that communicates between the different systems. And, and we have to do it there. I mean, it's a product of, of the previous discussion where um, the standards aren't there and the integration is there, isn't there. So we end up having to build certain things in that absence. But beyond that, trying to, you know, scratch build a system that already exists, uh, it's a lot of money. And if the benefit isn't there, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Yeah, I, I, uh, so we have 119 systems at Blackstone overall, and we built 12 of them, and we bought 100 and whatever, seven of them. So, um, so we clearly like to buy stuff, but I would say that I think I'm probably, maybe I'm a little bit closer to, to the, uh, your opinion, that I think it's, it, it, it's a real skill to figure out how everything fits together well, and um, I think people under, like I struggle with, you know, shadow IT and, you know, everybody uses Google so they think they're a technology expert about how things work, um, and, and that is a real problem. And I think like, you need to have a technology strategy and you need to sometimes have development capacity to implement that strategy to make the right decisions for the long term and not just buy the, you know, the, the lollipop that some vendor shows you that you think looks really nice. But, you know, if it doesn't fit well in your environment, it's a major problem. So I, I see a lot of people making short term decisions that backfire in the long term and then they have to come back five years from now, throw everything away and start again. Um, and it'll be a little bit easier because you'll have SaaS and, and you can get going, but you'll still have a mess to clean up if you don't, you know, efficiently architect your, uh, your, your cities. It's sort of, sort of like if you go to India, like, you know, there's, there's no rhyme or reason for any city stuff. Even New York, right, it's all over the place. No central planning in most of the city or some of the city. And then you look at the, the efficiency of the grid system um, in, in Midtown, it's so much better. So just make sure you're putting the grid system in before you let people start building just about anywhere with any system. And I completely agree, and, and I think it's worth noting that like, the developer that I do have, um, which I'll just say, oh, well, might hire him right after this. <laughs> At least for now. LinkedIn, you, know, his name? You, can't, you can't protect him anymore. His, uh, do you know what your boss said about you? <laughs> he said he wanted you gone. <laughs> He's, he's developing something for us that is like a special sauce type application that just, you know we couldn't go out and buy. It. So you know if, if you can't buy it, yeah, I would support building it. But, uh, right. but one, don't thing, hire. one thing though is like Jim, you're doing a lot of outsourcing. So build versus buy, you know, on the buy side, you're buying a package solution. On the build side, you know, you're either building on your own or you're building with outside consultants. But either way, that's custom code. That code is now becomes legacy code. That yeah, counts. You know, so it comes. But, yeah, the, 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 the model though is to is to pick your partner smartly, like even BTS, and then influence the product direction. Right? Have have a have a, have a say influence um, in terms of you know make sure the R and D hopefully aligns to you know so which I think you, you know most of us are good at pretty good at right. Well, we should gang up on the vendors. <laughs> I think we do. I think Robert and I do. So I think you the Tommy so, so I, had a question. Yeah. I, think, uh, I did, you guys actually just started touching on it, and I, I was going to say, we talked about build versus buy, but I didn't know if you had any thoughts first on customized versus configuration, and how you solution where a vendor might be getting 90% of the way there, and you need a little something for the 10%. Right. I think you mentioned kind of influence and partnership is the best way to do it, but I don't know if you have any other thoughts on customization well, in general. Yeah, part of it depends on immediacy. Okay. And there, there's there's an amount of time that it takes anyone to develop something, and one of the questions I'll ask up front is, well, if, if the vendor's going to build it in the next release, why do I want to custom code something that they're going to beat me to the door with? Um, you know, when you start customizing, again, it's like, you know, great, you customized it. Uh-oh, you customized it. Now you own this thing, and every time you go through a revision or a change, you're dealing with a certain amount of fallout associated with those, those customizations that you made. Yeah, if you get to 90%, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you have to struggle. You, know, you got to put, it, it is a struggle to get the your folks to accept the 90% as the 100%. Yeah. And I think you got to really do an ROI analysis on whether that 10% means anything. Because yeah. most of the time, everybody wants, you know, everything's got to be painted the right color and all this other crap. And it really doesn't matter um, at the end of the day. Just, you know, figure out the minimum and get that live and then learn from it. The other thing I would say is, is choose your vendors based upon the future, not the present. 
too many people are <coughs> focused on, well, this is what they have today. And if, you know, if somebody shows up who, um, you know, it's sort of like the NBA draft. If there was like a 35-year-old who had a better three-point percentage or a 21-year-old who had a better, th you'd, you'd clearly draft the 21-year-old because you know that they're going to get better. Um, and I think that's the same is true for software vendors. You've got to be looking at the future so that when you're, like, how much do you believe that they'll hit their release in three months, six months, or a year? Versus, you know, and, and lay that all out and then make that a very, very primary part of your decision making process. I, I just, I, I know I said it already, but the partnership with your vendors, you know, as you kind of move to these outside models, that you got to invest in time. You got to be people. That, Places like this, you got to get Rick's ear. You got to, you got to, you got to make the investment. Um, and some of that's structured, some of that's unstructured. But it's about partnership and influence, right? So. And if that ten percent really means a lot, you probably have the wrong product. And just to add to that, so to, even for us as, as the vendor, right? I mean, we do it all the time. Like that last ten percent. I'm actually having a meeting next week where someone sent me a a forty a forty uh, list, a forty variable gap list. Like very specific things that 90% of them we are building and about 10% we will never build, right? And the question is like, can you really live without these five things that I know no one will even notice, right? So to your point, that's where the partnership is, is has to be strong, where we can prove to you the ROI is there and your business team can really sit back and think and say, okay, even though the, the legacy system that we've had for 30 years, which literally was built in 1994, has these things that no one's ever used, are we okay changing? And I think that's been a, I mean, with our partnership with everyone on the stage, and also Gary here, and every CEO in this room, that's been a big part of our roadmap, is working with you to figure out, okay, we really don't need these other things, even though you've been, you've seen them, um, but I don't think it ever goes away. I think the real question is, can we get everybody comfortable with 90? Because it's never 100. Yeah. So I, I think it's <coughs> important also for, for your team, and I think you do have it, to have the discipline to say, we're not going to bend metal for that last 10% because yeah. we'll make our product non-extensible going forward. So your your design has to be extremely careful and symmetrical so that you're really adding the flexibility but not cutting yourself. Anytime, off. anytime we do a customization like that, you know, two things could happen. Either now, now that customization is pretty much gone out of support because we're focused on the next thing, or we we talk about that customization. Like, what is it that's needed? And then we talk to 15 other customers and say, you know, what, is this something that you also need? And then we come up with a version that sort of fits everybody's need. Right? Yeah. That's the whole thing. Yeah, another, another piece, of just on when you're doing a customization, figure out your back out plan um, while you're building the customization. So essentially, like, how am I going to turn this off in, uh, in a year or two years or three years? And people don't think about that when they're building software. They're like, just get it done. It doesn't matter. I need to need the function. And um, just assume, you know, if it's a if it's something related to VTS's use cases, they're eventually going to get there, probably, right? If it's you know in CRM for us, it's like we're eventually Salesforce is going to get there with a bunch of different things. If we have to build something in the interim, I want to have a clear plan on how I can turn it off seamlessly and move it into the the product because. You want less lines of code every year if you can, you know, if you can do it. Yeah, you, you need to make sure your interim solution is in fact interim. It doesn't just become part of the landscape and stuff. You have to right, because you and you and you're building behaviors that are hard to change because everybody hates to change. So, you know, if you're going to build it in a way that looks like the product that you're likely going to migrate to or does things in a similar way. There's one other alternative too. Um, one of the things we've done is we actually built a customization platform. There, because of the business that we're in, there are certain needs that we have that no one else is going to have. This, this, these are things that just they're never going to be commercially available because the market's way too narrow. So where you know you have to live with certain things, you can actually create the second platform that is nothing but customization, and it's just never going to go away. You know that because you'll have those needs forever. But since it's just one thing and you're maintaining one thing, it's at least cost efficient, and you're not, you're no longer dependent on um, a core set of uh, software vendors. So if they need to make a change or you need, you need to swap out a company, that happens. Companies go out of business or change or somebody new comes in. You can retain that all that code and not have to do what I, what I call perfective maintenance on things, where you're constantly going back and redoing the same thing over and over again. Um, so switching topics a little bit, um, well, it's actually pretty similar, but uh, what, what advice would you give to a CIO at a smaller firm 
or a, a CIO that's uh, behind the curve technically? How do you catch up? Update your resume. I would say focus on um, focusing, focus on understanding the business challenges first. Like far and away, the the, the era of the technologist. And first of all, don't if you're a business person who's doing it, don't don't uh, please don't come in and say, well, I don't know anything about technology because that's the most fucking annoying thing um, <laughs> to technologists. It's like, oh God, like you know, um, I don't know anything about technology, but I want to tell you how to do your job. That's typically what happens. But um, I would say you want to focus on learning the business problems um, and then fixing the data architecture first. And if you if you can speak the language that everybody's talking to you about what are the challenges and you can start to drain the swamp of data, duplicate data, bad data, then whatever systems you put on top of that is going to be, are, are going to be much more successful. Yeah, I totally agree with Bill. When you, it's like a, I have a term, you know, you got to crawl before you walk, before you run, right? I use that all the time with my team and it, you, it success builds on itself. So you got to get a business, um, you separate from data, but you got to find opportunities tied to the business that have a clear NL return a clear return, and then build on success, right? That's, that's the, you know, that's... Yeah. I, I was thinking the, the, when you asked the question, a different angle, which is that the smaller company isn't going to have the, um, this, they don't have a scalable enough model to live in a fully best of breed world because they're just not going to be able to cobble everything together. So the challenge there is, you know, they're going to end up probably more on the single stack um, and dependency on a vendor, and then you got to figure out how much deprecation of functionality you're going to have as a result of the fact that you're not in the best of breed model. I think that's probably the biggest challenge. Where if you ended up with a data exchange layer, like we were talking earlier, in an open world, I mean that's that's the best argument for me to for the industry to drive towards openness and a some sort of a data bus that anyone can clamp onto, because then it, it's not just going to be the biggest companies that have the scale to do large integrations. But I do think that's. Uh, you know, a very large challenge for a, a smaller company is they just don't have the, the, the powder to, uh, to do the integration. Yeah, I think the other challenge in a small company or the smaller organization, I think you alluded to this, uh, you, typically, you know, IT has two functions. You know, number one, you have to keep the lights on and keep things functioning and keep the basic, you know, security and integrity of the systems functional. And without that, nothing else really matters. The second part, which grows as the firms get larger, is that business embedded function of subject matter experts who face the business, who really understand the business's problems and can design technology solutions to fit them. Yeah, and as companies grow, and I've seen this in places I've worked, you build out that function and it's, it's very much appreciated by the business if it really is embedded. And it takes away the kind of black market IT that exists in a lot of smaller shops where the CFO might say, hey, you know, I used this solution in my last company, so that must be the right one. And it gets done without IT's real involvement. And you end up with a kind of hodgepodge of silos. Um, I've cleaned up that, that problem a couple of times in my career. It's, it's not a good place to be. And, and you, you mitigate that by, if you come into a, a smaller shop, or if you're a smaller shop that's growing, really focus on developing that expertise in your staff of people who can face the business can read a balance sheet, can understand business problems, so they can design the right solution. I think you're, I think you're talking about the IT unicorn, <laughs> which is essentially someone who understands the subject matter very well, like basically someone who went to school for real estate, oh, and in their spare time happens to be building websites. Like that's, that's the guy you want, or who you want. You, you can find them, and, yeah. and, and no fair yeah. looking on LinkedIn, I actually have them. <laughs> I think that's the right advice for every CIO, is you know, while we deal in technology, our first obligation is to understand what each part of our business, every business unit in our place, what they do. We have to understand what they do as if we were going to work in the department. If we understand what they do and what their problems are, then we can, then we can be effective. I actually think real estate has a benefit, is easier than other industries because every single one of us has to live someplace, has to rent or buy something. Everybody's been through it, even the, the you know, the computer science major, you know, understands that that you need a, a three bedrooms and what a stacking plan would be. It's just right. obvious. Other industries, it's much more kind of uh, much diff much more difficult. So much much deeper learning curve yeah. than finance. So.
So I'm a business guy. I don't really know anything about technology. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is your that's, that's good. You've really enjoyed like this conversation. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, as the uh, cloud platforms and all the uh, front real estate technology starts booming a little bit more, have you been seeing a little bit more of a, um, a shift in the way the IT groups collaborate with the business units? And um, are there you know starting to become more unicorns that kind of so it's it's not just real estate. I mean, this is if you know if you're a CIO and you're talking to other CIOs, there's there's been an evolution that probably started seven to ten years ago, where um, we are becoming more and more and more embedded in into the business, uh, working hard to become a trusted advisor, as opposed to somebody in the corner that keeps certain things running. And, and what that really comes down to is the ability to collaborate and to understand. Now, i tell you one or two things to know about it. Um, I, I don't believe there's anyone up here that will tell you we think that the business is going to learn technology. That isn't going to happen. It just won't. Um, so it's really incumbent on people in technology to learn everything they can about the business. And, Really, you have you have two functions you're working on in this role. One is you have to keep the lights on. You have to run everything. You have to provide good service. You have to have the right platforms. If the foundation of the building is no good, you're done. You're not going to build anything on top of it. But once you get that under control, and most of us will sort of move that aside, have somebody sort of do the day-to-day -day running of it, then we're really looking for business benefit embedding inside <coughs> of business units. Um, oddly enough, in many cases, as a technologist, you become the communication point between other business units. I've sat in meetings where I've had to explain to the Treasury Department what the accounting department that sits literally eight feet from them is doing because it's the exact same project. They're in parallel doing the same thing. It happens all the time. The, the, the one thing I would say, is speaking of the business technology divide, is like there has to be a curiosity to learn enough to help the problem solver technologist to iterate a solution, right? So it's not about like, you don't need to understand what, you know, JavaScript library we're gonna use to do something or, or you know, the backend SQL configurations, but if you understand that what a database is and that it has to talk to something else and then, you know, just like the, the general frameworks, you can then be extremely valuable as, as a, a a sounding board to make sure you get to the right grid system, you know, and to take that back that metaphor. Um, and that's where the frustration comes is when people like they completely glaze over when you mention anything about the technology, <laughs> such that all oh, they just want everything cheaper and faster. It's like, yeah, no kidding. So do I, right? And I want to be six five. Um, so, uh, so, you know, <laughs> get on an airplane. <laughs> six five and athletic. <laughs> Then you have life expectancy problems. Okay, all right. <laughs> Forget the. <laughs> I think what uh, was said a minute ago about um, the glue between the departments is is it's. Well, I find that fascinating in our organization where so we're in the middle of a, of a spin off and a lot of departments are right in the middle of. We're just getting to the point where everyone's really got to get involved. <coughs> and I see frustration in my department with people saying, "Why is it that we have to be the ones?" who we'll go tell billing and cash and treasury that they're all going to be doing the following and, and the world's going to change. Because, because we do is the answer. And I think it enhances the value. Um, you know, we are somewhat the glue that pulls the departments together. We're, we're in a very different place than we were many years ago. I mean, you know, the, in, in Ventas, we have a project management office. It, it's an IT project management office, and it runs all projects across the enterprise. So, you know, it, you become a clearinghouse for information exchange going between different areas. Um, and I think it's, it's partially because of focus. I, I'm in, now in front of the business probably 80 to 90% of the time. And you can't help but learn when you're in all these different areas, gathering information, asking questions, building, you know, we'll, we'll build an IT strategic plan. And um, it's actually incredibly closely aligned with the strategic plan of the whole business, um, and in some cases, precedes it. Rick mentioned uh, the unicorn. How do you guys take care of What's your approach on retaining and attracting top talent and incentivizing talent in your firms? Yeah, um, well, I, 
I, I was the smart guy who wore jeans here, uh, specifically for branding reasons. Um, specifically, specifically for that question. Um, uh, did, did you plant them there? No, I did not. I did not. Um, it's really hard. It is. No, there's nothing specific about a real estate technologist versus a, a financial technologist versus a, you know social media technologist or whatever. So. Um, because of the transferability of skills, people can jump between industries much more fluidly than like a broker could in, in real estate. Um, that creates talent wars, that creates like dislocations when Google opens a huge office in New York and, and salaries go up and so on. So it's difficult. We've, um, uh, there's recently some articles about this, but like we opened a whole new office for Blackstone, and if you guys walked into that one, you wouldn't recognize it as being Blackstone specifically. We were trying not to make it overly, uh, you know, trying too hard, um, but it, so it, it maintains a little bit of the Blackstone uh, culture, but it had to be different. Um, we, we have no dress code there, um, and, you know, there's some basic stuff that, you, that, that needs to get done just to kind of compete in the first place, um, and, and then you have to build a great culture where people feel like they're contributing to the mission of the company. Um, so it's kind of like a double-edged sword. I feel like just a ticket to entry has gotten higher because people are so so wooed now um, uh, to go to pretty much any place where they like, free food and free this and you know it's hard to compete with that when you come out of college and, and uh, you don't even have to work you know. anymore just come right exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like, it must be really tough ultimately, in New York for it's extremely difficult in New York and like and ultimately um, it's just different right and I think it's been it's been interesting watching Blackstone and we've evolved where um, it's a different type of a situation for us um, because on certain roles, like we, we don't have any problems keeping and retaining because we, you know people want to come and it's like you know it's it's the supply and demand is in the complete opposite. So it's been uh, our organization has had to learn a lot about changing our approach to a certain type of uh, talent. Can I just leave the follow up? Have you guys strategically thought about changing the incentive around this 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 arena? In method pay. Yeah, in terms of aligning it more with the business value that you Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a very, very low turnover rate, you know, one, two percent for five years running. Um, so technology people are able to compare one number with another number. They're really good at that. So, you know. <laughs> let's start out with Although they're not good at understanding what a bonus is. Yeah. Generally. Well. Yeah. So I think you got to move more to base because that's what all the tech companies do. So we did do a shift. We're much more base heavy than we were five years ago. Um, this financial services is, is you know, so bonus, bonus heavy that it just throws things out of whack. When someone's coming out of school, and even if their total comp is $100,000, if you tell somebody they're going to get a paycheck for 60, and then eventually some way down the road I'm going to give you 40 more, versus they're going to get a paycheck for 100 every two weeks, that's a huge difference. Um, so I'd say that's a key shift. Yeah, yeah we, we actually went the other way and shifted more towards equity. And, uh, you know, really the, the, the reason behind it is because in, in our research we, we figured that uh, the market wasn't going to get better for us from a retention perspective. We just, the, the gap between, and it's, it's very sad, I mean, we, the number of people that were graduating with technical backgrounds, STEM backgrounds today versus five or ten years ago, when you look at, at the demand, the gap gets wider every year. And it's, it, it's a little bit hard to imagine because at the same time, there are a lot of people coming out of school who can't get a job because maybe they majored in something where the placement rate is very low. So, um, you know, part of, part of the problem, I believe, is because there's a perception out there to not get into that major in the first place based on 10 years ago, 15 years ago, very public discussion of oh, you know outsourcing overseas blah 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 you'll be competing with somebody in a foreign country so a lot of people stop going down that road because it's a lot of work it's expensive it's very hard and in fact what happened was the exact opposite the demand did not go down it went up and it continues to climb so um, our focus is more on hiring people to have them for ten years not two or three years and um, Equity can be an amazingly powerful tool for that if walking out the door costs you an astronomical amount of money in terms of stock vesting.
And I just have to work very closely with our HR. I mean, I, I spot a couple of positions every year that I want reassessed. Um, I'm very focused this year on growing outside capacity, capacity, not outsourcing necessarily, but outside capacity that I can turn to, and I'm putting in contracts in place that I can actually go to capacity when I need it. <laughs> Um, so it's really, I'm just, I'm trying to think through how to be flexible and responsive. Um, it's a challenge. And I can tell you, I mean, the last three hires, I, we had to approve above range, range, you know, offers. It just, it's the reality of the market right now, right? So, and I just, little, I just literally had my entire department reassessed a year ago. I mean, it's just out of whack already, you know. I think the two things that I would comment, one is that um, really the most talented tech people don't want to come work for real estate companies. They want to go work for tech companies, so that's, that's a bit of a challenge. Um, but along the lines of what you were saying, Jim, uh, I think when you see somebody who's really good on your staff, you have to do everything in your power to move them faster and on a plane that would just not be a normal plane. And so we look for rising stars and then do whatever we can to, to keep you. Yeah, I think in, in addition to being creative about organization <coughs> as it works in your organization, like we are trying to bias more towards uh, long-term uh, or to come more towards equity just because it is a stickier uh, attribute. But that being said, you also have to be careful that people don't perceive themselves as being underpaid. You know, they actually see that as comp. The other thing I, I'd comment on is um, you need to think, of, given the shortage of people that are coming into this, this field, I've found good luck being flexible in where I find talent. Uh, I've converted a couple of my now unicorns from the business. People who had already deep understanding of the business and expertise, but showed that they had some technical ability as well. And, and these are not traditional IT technical people. These are people who have learned that part of their job while already having the business side. And they found it to be a role for them that was more compelling. You know, it's, it, it doesn't work for everybody. You know, you're not gonna convert everyone to this sort of thing, but it is a way that you can find talent where if I call up a recruiter and say, I'm looking for this profile, It'll cost me a lot of money, and it'll be very hard to find, and there's a lot of competition. Um, to, to that point, as you talk about more reliance on technology uh, vendors, can you talk about vendors versus partners from a technology perspective? How many of all the people that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are really strategic to you, and who are there? Are there two, three that you guys rely on? as real partners from a technology perspective? How, how are you defining partner? I'm sorry to ask, but there's Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, strategic to the business, that you, the application, the, the, the vendor is providing you either multiple services or a strategic application. How many of those that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis do you consider strategic? And who would they be? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just comment. I mean, I, I, I've actually been out uh, more conferences than I care to be. This I, I didn't travel last year. This year, like, it's crazy, the first six months, because we have a major thing going on with Argus, Altus, right? Got a major stuff going on with VTS, right? I've got, um, you know, Angus Group is a big provider. We've got three projects going on with them out of Toronto, right? So so this investment in keeping a, keeping a presence is... Um, it just, it's, it all, it's all come together in the six months right now, uh, but it's, uh, it's really important um, uh, to kind of maintain those kind of, you know, we're, we're replacing Dyna, I'm going to AE as our valuation <coughs> engine, for example. You've got DCF ending this month, right? Going, you know, the, the end of life for that product. So we've been, anyway, I've been investing, I've been investing where I need to um, in some of these strategic relationships and keep being active, right, so. I think almost, I think you have to treat almost every vendor like a partner, um, especially because the pace of change is so high. And you know, every time VTS comes out with a new release, you can't count on like random user getting the release notes to suddenly start using it. I'm sure it's probably one of your biggest uh, hurdles, right? It was at Capital IQ over there. Couldn't get people to use the new stuff. They said they wanted it, and then they don't use it. And, and so there's that con consistent dialogue that you have to be having with the users of all the solutions and with the vendors so that you can be as up to speed on everything. So I would just, you know, try to treat everybody like a partner. Um, it takes a lot more time, but it, I think it pays off because you're getting benefits that you, uh, you wouldn't otherwise, or they just kind of, they would just float off, they would evaporate. 
Well, it's, a, it's the kind of thing where you know we work hard to align with the business and make sure we understand our business's needs and, and, and can serve them appropriately. It's really kind of the same dynamic where if I sit down with VTS and really have a good dialogue with them on new features and things that are evolving in my business, that means their solution is better aligned with where we're headed. And I make sure that we're well positioned to promote the features that they do, that they do come out with. So it, it really, you know, it's, there's a limited amount of bandwidth that, you, that we all have, but for solutions that are kind of core to your platform, it, it, I, I try to take the time to, to make sure I could, uh, work with those people. So it seems like you've, in your organizations, have been able to collect data, organize it, and then be able to pull and extract it out into your businesses. What are you exploring now in terms of the problems you can solve or the intelligence you're looking to gather around um, uh, any type of predictive tools, uh, machine learning, data science, uh, and artificial intelligence? That was um, literally the next question. So, uh, <laughs> did, did you handle well, five dollars? Well played. Well played. Well played. Could, you, could you add in uh, like a data lake versus a data warehouse approach on top of that and talk a little bit about what you're doing there as well? Be very interesting. Between a data lake, you're saying what's that? Data lake. Data lake. Data lake. Data lake. Yeah, I don't know Can't if there's much difference. Um, I don't think there's much difference between that. I, I would say uh, we're doing, we're starting out. So I think it's early days um, and everybody's trying. If you know, if there's a talent problem as it relates to technology talent, data scientists are like, you know, even worse. Um, there are data science making millions in salary um, on Wall Street right now um, who are 30 years old. So. Um, it gives you an idea of how there's just no talent there. So I think everyone's kind of searching for the right answer um, to get to those insights. But we certainly, you know, we're just in the early early innings of that of that journey. For us, they do. We're not doing as much, not the current active focus on machine learning, but that the two areas where we're looking, and I think most of us are looking at the same. It's all in the building management systems and operating the buildings. There's a lot of machine learning and AI there, and uh, lease abstracting is something that one day we'll hopefully be able to do. Um, for our, our, immediate, our immediate focus is more on the analytics of so the databases we're building and the BI warehouses we're building are just getting more and more rich with the analytics that feed the earnings model that people spend a long time, you know, historically spent a long time uh, cultivating by hand or worse yet couldn't really cultivate by hand. So we're spending most of our time on just making sure the precision of the earnings model and the statistics that can come out of it on a on an aggregate basis um, feed the business? So it's it, for us, it's been an iterative process. You know, we really started out with speeding up the transaction itself, getting the right workflow in place, being able to close the books quickly with less effort. There's a bandwidth issue here. Um, you know, if you're spending a lot of time <clears throat> producing reports, producing day-to-day -day information, you, you don't have the time to start thinking about looking through the windshield. So the bidding, beginning of phase of that is, is getting everything in order so that you know maybe your closed process is six days instead of 19. And then building upon that so that you know the, the autopsy part happens very quickly. Then getting to the point where you can see today what's going on. And a lot of that is drilled down. Here's my dashboard. Boy, that doesn't look good. Let me click on that and see what constitutes that and drill down four levels, uh-oh, something's wrong over here. And then, you know, looking at trend and analytics is really about looking at the same data points over time in an aggregated basis so that you can see, you know, is this trending down, is it trending up, what's happening, what does it correlate to? I couldn't agree more about the issue with talent. Um, you know, I, I, I came from an electronic trading world. I'm not a, a real estate person by background. And um, you know there are companies out there paying incredible money to get somebody to help them to figure out how to make more dollars when computers trade against computers. People don't trade against people anymore. There's no pits with people yelling. So all those people are making immense money uh, trying to figure out how to work in a market. And their value is so high that um, you're probably much better off in a scenario like that working with people internally and learning and understanding their challenges and then building the next level of capability to help enable them and going through step after step and, and working towards that endpoint. 
but it's it's real. You can get there. Yeah, the, uh, one other piece that I think everybody think interesting. Um, I was at an, an event of all CIOs at Sequoia, and they were all like Fortune 100 style CIOs, and um, the only people who were really pioneering in AI machine learning was the insurance industry, and the the reason that that they were was that they had a way to measure the the outcome. So you know, it's all about actuarial tables, it's all about loss ratio, and they could basically, they had the training set that they could load into machine learning algorithms and they could see what improvements they could make to their model. Um, other than that, everybody else was in this, we're gonna play around with it, we're gonna do it. So I think the hype cycle on AI is way out in front of the enterprise. Um, and unless you have a specific mathematical you know, a set of results that you can that you can train against. Um, there's going to be very, they're going to be very, very targeted use cases outside. Yeah, of that. I think everybody's ready to invest in it, but no one has the quality of data you need to actually use it. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's the core problem. If, yeah. if you have a bunch of spreadsheets laying around, you have nothing to harvest. Right. There's there's no way to draw a correlation unless you build that foundation of information and process <laughs> to lay on top of. Also in our world, we really don't live in a big data world. Yeah. And so one of the things you need for AI is a really big data world. The only place I see it in our world um, is again in the, in the buildings. Buildings, right. buildings. Yeah. So yeah. buildings should tune themselves over time because of the massive amount of data. Um, we, have, we, we don't have big data. The data that we do have, there's a lot of snowflake situations as well. So getting any sort of consistency in trending is hard. Yeah. Yeah, the insurance industry is, is interesting. Um, I also, like in electronic trading, um, you know, years ago I worked for Ed Fund where we built this uh, to, for statistical arbitrage trading reasons. You know, that is another situation where you have a lot of data, it's accurate, it's clean and consistent, and you can back test against it. Medical, medical is ill. Yes. Security is another one. Yeah, yeah. yeah security. Yeah. Security. Yeah. Yeah. We use some products there yeah. that use it. There's also an issue of transparency of data too. I mean, there's, there's a quality of the data. If you're putting bad information into an AI system, it, the AI system will not fix the bad data. The other problem is that, you know, if you were to look at a market, for instance, um, there's a bid, there's an ask, it's a commoditized entity, there's a way to compare very quickly. And the level of maturity in this space as far as the availability of, of data and um, the commoditization of the product is, is so much lower. So it makes for a more co complicated picture. Doesn't mean you cannot do it, you absolutely can, but you have to be aware of what the limitations are of the information. There's also so much wood to chop. I mean, you, you know, at, at all of our organizations, it just terms of like hooking workflow together, using data effectively without using machine learning and, and stuff that, it's kind of funny, like everybody always wants to run to like the sexy new thing, oh, I want it to automatically do it for me. I'm like, why don't we just connect everything so everyone knows what the hell's going on? Um, you know, this is Let's be able to see idea. the data first. Uh, right, exactly. But I will say, come back to Robert, there's, there's a couple of plays in police abstracting that are really fascinating, really fascinating. And I've seen, I've sort of seen two companies in the last, I mean, one I've been tracking for a while, but some very interesting stuff, so. Yeah, and that, that, that could translate to real savings and money. Yeah. You know, so. I think we got time for one more question. I'd be curious, just kind of continuing some of this conversation to get you out of the panel's feedback on, you know, looking forward in the next two, three years. What what do you guys think um, is most prime for disruption in CRM tech? I think, um, we think <coughs> about, uh, with, with Dorothy, just about, the, been looking at like honest buildings and some of the things that are happening on the on the real estate development side of things. I think John, you and I were talking a little bit about Argus last night, but I'd be curious just to hear everybody's thoughts on it. I'm going to take that first. Yeah. <laughs> Other than VTS, <laughs> what are the most exciting technologies? I, I I just think you know I mean you look at the VTS model and you know uh, again someone was highlighted commenting this morning, you know, our industry has been a train wreck of CRM implementation. Some of us are dating ourselves, but there were multi-million dollar implementations in the early part of the last decade, and VTS is probably one of the easiest implementations I have ever done in my career. I could state, I could actually state that, right? Get that one on the t-shirt. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can honestly, 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 I can honestly,
I can see that. Yeah. 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 One last question. Yeah. 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 Well, now we're good. Yeah. <laughs> what, was, what was your question again? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, um, so I, I just, I think there are a couple of things in our industry that are ripe for disruption. Some of us know it, you know, I, I just, I don't know, you know, the whole, you know, what CoStar does, what, um, uh, you know, Argus does, what, you know, the, again, you, you've got this ability in these new technologies to leapfrog, but there's not, I don't, I don't know if I see them, I don't know what's going to happen, but th that kind of disruption, the opportunity that the, the, the newer tools and the ability and wherewithal permit, you know, there's, 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 you know, there's opportunity, right? Again, I don't, I don't know if I see it, I don't know if it will happen. Uh, but you know, uh, VTS comes along with with it, that those those enablers and the technology to do that. Is are there other sectors that can uh, that occur? Right. I think so. that most of the most of the this industry is slow moving to change, and sort of there's also risk, risk averse. Right. And there's like three years ago, there was this enormous <laughs> influx of venture capital, right? That and these companies are all still like toddlers, right? And you know, people don't grow up in in especially in a slow moving, changing environment so quickly. So I think there's so much more kind of juice to squeeze out of the orange of all the companies that you all know the names of that haven't gotten anywhere near what they believe their real vision is. So I, don't, I think it's gonna be very difficult for, um, you know, for, for, for new companies to come in and be hugely disruptive in a quick manner. It's all a ground game. Um, Honest Building, you mentioned, is like they've been around for a long time already, and they're just getting to starting to get some scale, and, and you know, and, and but it's a ground game. They got to go convince each person individually to use it, and I think VTS um, has a little bit more network effect and has been able to grow faster. But even you know, I'm sure you guys would say it's not simple to uh, to get every client no. um, to engage and to adopt the platform. So um, because of that, I think it's going to be hard to have anything that you would consider truly like disruptive. Yeah. I, I would uh, second that. The, the problem with disruption in real estate is the real estate industry. Is it is a, it's been a laggard industry forever, and it moves slowly. So while I see opportunities where the technology that's in place is not great, I, I, it's very it's very hard to see it happening. And then when you look at the VTS Hightower war slash merger, it's a it's a it's. A, it's that's an outlier. You know how much therapy he's got to pay for now? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, no, but the, the, the meteoric rise of the number of square feet that went on to this, to you know, leasing CRMs have been around in small forms, either custom or Salesforce or others, and you could measure the implementations in teeny amounts in, in three years. You've got five billion square feet on a leasing CRM. So, you know, the, the interesting thing to study is what was it about leasing that was right? Because there's almost nothing else in our space that we've ever seen to go from zero to 100 miles an hour that quickly. Yeah, I think there's you know another force that's going to drive disruption or you know more probably accurately just accelerated change. You know, I agree. This is an industry that is underinvested in technology. It's uh, you know the financial crisis hit at a point where you know everybody just hunkered down and wrote it out, and then we come out of that. And I think what's driving a lot of the change we see now is scale. We're bigger. The firms are bigger. The market is growing. And there's more capital flowing into it. We can't manage these businesses with throwing more bodies at problems. We have to have better technology. We have to have better services. So I, I think in a lot of cases, it's, it's not a ma matter of somebody coming out with a, a good, good solution like DTS. It's because you know, businesses are facing the fact that we can't grow and scale efficiently with what we have. We need better tools. And, and let alone if another cycle comes, right? You know, just the, the, you know, how you need to be even more efficient um, just if we enter another cycle, right? We're, we're the late, you know, we're, the cycles have been unprecedented. Yeah, yeah. That's true. All right, so um, we're, we're a bit over time already. Um, so, you know, just a couple of takeaways. It sounds like obviously invest in data, um, hire unicorns, um, get your framework figured out. Um, uh, basically, I want to just thank you guys for, for taking the time. Um, definitely appreciate it. Give these guys a round of applause.